from the College by the Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. Our topic for today is dermatology, or more specifically, we wish to talk about the diagnosis and treatment of many different kinds of skin diseases. As a matter of fact, our guest has informed me that there are more than five to 600 different types of diseases, and certainly today, we will only have time for some examples, but we're so pleased to welcome to our program, Dr. Elizabeth Venus, who is a dermatologist in Spokane, Washington. Uh, she comes to us with very impressive credentials. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry from Goucher College in Maryland. Her MD degree is from Georgetown University, and she did her residence at John Hopkins University. Uh, welcome to our program, Dr. Venice. It's very much a pleasure to have you here, and you have very impressive credentials, and I know you're busy in your practice, and you've been kind to be with us this afternoon. My pleasure. Thank you. And as always, I'm very pleased to have our regular panelist, Janelle Burke, who is an attorney in the state of Idaho. And Janelle shall commence today's questioning of our guest. Dr. Van Noss, welcome to the program. Can you tell us what is a dermatologist? When would a person go to see a dermatologist? For what reasons? A dermatologist is a physician uh, who's completed four years of medical school and an additional year usually of general medical training, internship in uh, usually internal medicine and then has also completed three years of residency training specifically in dermatology and only uh, treating and diagnosing skin disease uh, uh, during those three years. There are some dermatologists that have completed other types of training uh, and some are actually internal medicine physicians who've uh, decided to switch specialties to become dermatologists or, or um, uh, others that have been in family practice and have switched and taken on those extra three years of training. Uh, a, a dermatologist is someone that can take care of any uh, degree of skin disease and from even minor things to more complicated and rare things. And um, if you thought you had a skin problem, then uh, a dermatologist would be someone you would consider going to. Um, if you had a family doctor that you uh, wanted to see you could try them first and they may decide at that point that there was something that they wanted uh, help with and then they would say well I want you to see a dermatologist. But that is one of the nice things about dermatologists and patients with skin problems is most patients can recognize they have something wrong with their skin and they can go directly to uh, a specialist uh, knowing that that would be the right place to go as opposed to say if you had uh, pain in your abdomen, you wouldn't be really sure which specialist to go to, and you might start off with your primary doctor. Uh, Dr. Benos, we are so thankful that you brought with you a number of slides, and I want to say to our viewers that some of these are rather graphic, and uh, uh, they may or may not want to some members of the family to view them, but it's very important to be able to visually demonstrate what we're talking about. And as I indicated at the end of the program, there are so many hundreds of types of skin diseases, and you brought with you 12 slides. And I'm going to ask our staff to put those up on the screen. And uh, would you take us through these, please? Sure. OK. Right here, we're looking at uh, the skin of a, a young child. And um, this child has been experiencing these uh, little small bumps uh, that are sometimes itchy. And you see in the upper right corner that one of them uh, was so itchy that the top of it came off. And it looks quite inflamed. And this is a very common problem. It's called molluscum contagiosum which is uh, a long, fancy name for uh, little warts. <laughs> These are quite contagious and uh, seem to be in some uh, situations almost an epidemic between uh, children. And um, uh, uh, oftentimes, they go away by themselves. However, there are treatments that are used to uh, make each little small wart go away um, and uh, clear it up completely. Uh, lots of times children go for several months, almost maybe years, with these little bumps undiagnosed. And if you look very closely at each one, and you can't see it in this picture, if you look very closely, you'll see that there's a little teeny dell right in the center of each one of those bumps, and that helps you distinguish it from other types of warts that you may be more familiar okay, with. Especially if you do that. If we go to our next slide here now, and mm -hmm. you identify this for us. Yes, right here we're looking at a lady who has a problem um, uh, that is mostly brought on by the sun, and she's also very ill. 
Uh, this lady has systemic lupus erythematosus. You may have heard of that disease. It's an autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. And this illustrates how the skin can be an excellent way to assess what's going on internally and that many, many internal diseases are manifested in different ways on the skin and uh, this patient it not only needs uh, help with their skin, they also need help with their internal disease which may be involving multiple organs. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we're looking at a real close-up of, of, of someone's nose who's had an awful lot of sun exposure and an occasional burn and you probably are already are second guessing me on this one, but we're really dealing with a skin cancer here, more specifically a basal cell carcinoma. Basal cell carcinoma is the most common uh, cancer that there is. It's definitely the most uh, common skin cancer. And uh, it can be mutilating, deforming, however, usually not life-threatening. Uh, it is different from melanoma, which is basically a killer. Mm -hmm. uh, however, you really want to diagnose these early because if you let them go, they become very large, can erode down to the bone, and cause significant disfiguring. And so you want to get uh, many things. You want to get early treatment. That's correct. Here we're looking at a, uh, a dark, uh, slightly raised spot on someone's arm, and. Uh, this brings up the topic of moles and how to tell when you should be concerned about a mole. This actually looks pretty dark. Uh, however, it turned out to be all right under the microscope and therefore was not worrisome for melanoma. Melanoma is, uh, of course, the killer skin cancer that uh, it, we are most concerned about and uh, can be identified by uh, the uh, change in the shape, the color, the borders of, uh, of the spot. Uh, if we look at the next slide, we can see that we have a um, pretty unusual looking brown black area with a, a, a raised area in the middle. And you can see that the border is very irregular. The distribution of the color is quite irregular. And the shape is not quite symmetrical. Uh, it turns out that this also was not a melanoma. But if we look at the next slide, you'll see that this is particularly um, unusual appearing with very many shades of different browns, reds, and white, irregular border, and uh, a uneven color distribution. It also happens to be quite large. And what I've gone through is an explanation of what we call the ABCDs of melanoma. A for asymmetry, B for border, C for color difference, and D for diameter. So that uh, you can go by those four criteria to try to decide if your mole is unusual looking and if you have any doubt, the best thing is just to get it checked anyway. That's a good idea. Here we're looking at uh, an elbow and uh, a raised area with what, it, what would be best described as a silvery scale and a little redness around it. This is pretty typical for psoriasis, which is a disease of the skin, but occasionally is also manifested internally, primarily in the joints. There's a, a disease called psoriatic arthritis. Psoriasis is, uh, is a mystery disease, however, it can be treated with a variety of topical treatments and oral treatments, and it seems to love elbows and knees predominantly. And so it can be genetic too? Can it? Absolutely, yes. It does tend to run in families, although I have many patients who are the only one in their family that have it, but more commonly, yes, in families. I'm showing this one because it's kind of unusual to, show, to illustrate that there are some pretty um, strange things that can happen to the skin. Here we're looking at little uh, bumps on the uh, inside of the wrist and um, if you look at the next picture you can see some close-ups of this same disease uh, on another patient where some of these bumps actually look almost purplish mm -hmm. and flat. This is called lichen planus. Lichen planus is a pretty rare skin disease that can be extremely itchy and can really be a, a real problem for many people Again, it's a mystery disease. It has several treatments, but it can also be a sign that there's an internal problem going on. For example, uh, hepatitis C is uh, uh, quite often found in patients who have lichen planus, and so they should be tested for it. Here we're looking at a problem, and um, uh, it's not an accident that this necklace is in the picture because the necklace is the problem. Uh, this person has a rash. It's extremely itchy and they have an allergy to metal. 
Uh, most commonly, the allergy in metal allergy is nickel, which is found in most costume jewelry. So this is not uh, the family jewels here. This is a, uh, a, a cheap imitation, and that's why she's breaking out. Causes problems. <laughs> right. Um, getting back to more common problems, here's someone who's had actually quite bad acne in the past and is not doing so badly now, but you can see all the scarring, particularly on the left side of the face. She has some cysts, too, where those, you see those lumps also on the side of the nose. Acne is a, a, a fascinating type of skin disease, and there's so much that can be done for it, and I'm surprised that more people don't come to a dermatologist for help. Here we're looking at... Uh, a, a pretty bad case of athlete's foot, and this is extremely common. Probably at any one time, there are, uh, at least 20% of the population is suffering from some degree of athlete's foot. I almost think it's almost normal to have it, although in this picture, you're looking at this redness that is creeping up onto the sides of the foot, almost shaped like a shoe. Mm -hmm. And uh, this person happens to be very sensitive to athlete's foot, which is caused by a fungus, and they're almost getting an allergic reaction to the fungus, and they're in misery. They're very uh, irritated and inflamed, and there's uh, quite a bit you can do about this as well. It'd be very hard to walk and so forth. With Might be painful kind of to walk, not. yes, and quite itchy, uh, and uh, make one uh, want to remove the shoes at any at every possible moment to mm. to scratch. Well, we appreciate so much you taking us through those uh, visuals because it helps the individuals see what kind of work you do and the kind of things they might have. And I'm going to return to Janelle for more questioning. The next question is one about acne. We talked a little bit about the person on, in the picture who had acne, but, uh, and we also talked a little bit about acne before the show. It's something we think of as being teenage disease, but you indicated that that's not necessarily true. Uh, what causes acne and what can people do about it? Acne is a disease of the hair follicle. The hair follicle is the little tiny canal that the hair emerges from. And the hair follicle contains uh, an oil gland that goes with it. And that oil gland secretes oil into the canal, which usually makes its way up to the canal to the surface of the skin, and is very important for the integrity of the skin to have that oil. It keeps it from drying out and is a protection against the elements. But in acne, something goes awry. The oil itself has a different quality, more sticky, does not come out of the canal in a fluid manner, and at the opening of the canal, often the skin cells that are supposed to flake off as, as they normally do, they get stuck. And they get stuck in the oil, forming a plug in the opening of the canal. And that's the opening of the pore, as, some, as you can also call the hair follicle. And, um, and so you get a plug, and more oil backs up behind this plug. And bacteria overgrow and you can get a red, swollen, inflamed bump, or you may just have the plugged pore, which is called a comedone, or a blackhead. And um, in terms of what you can do about all of this, well, you try to aim therapy at one or all of the three factors. So uh, trying to change the way the skin sloughs so that it doesn't get stuck to the oil and flakes off like it should. You can change the quality of the oil by taking an internal drug, uh, or you can apply something to the skin, uh, for example, Retin-A or benzoyl peroxide that will help the oil become less sticky. And you can add antibiotics topically and orally to help keep the bacteria activity low. So washing the face, what about that? Washing, washing the face, if the face is where you're having it, but that's quite often where teenagers especially notice they're worried about the pimples. Mm -hmm. That's right. Washing the face is important, but overwashing can actually make it worse. Um, when you look at a blackhead and you see that blackness there, many people interpret that as dirt. It's not dirt, it's actually a concentration of the pigment of the skin in the skin cells that got plugged up in the pore and stuck to the oil. So that that is normal, the blackness. And so in an attempt to get rid of this blackness, many people scrub like crazy and use lots of soap and actually make things worse. It is helpful, however, to wash the skin mildly once or twice a day to try to at least get some of the excess oil off. However, scrubbing uh, is not helpful. I know that there are so many different treatments. Uh, I've already said on the program a couple of times that there are hundreds of types of diseases, and we don't have time to take uh, our viewers through all those. But 
talk about the different kinds of treatment that are most common. I know before the show you talked about some of them involve certain, I don't know where, uh, as a layperson, where it's uh, medications of what that are applied to the skin, others are orally taken. Mm -hmm. so just route us through mm -hmm. some of the different kinds of treatments that are most uh, commonly used. For acne? For uh, different kinds of skin. For treatment. different skin problems. Well, one of the uh, favorite uh, medications for, uh, that dermatologists used are topical steroids. They're very useful for many different skin problems, such as eczema, psoriasis, allergies. And uh, some of them have potential side effects. However, they can be very, very helpful. Um, in terms of uh, infections of the skin, antibiotics can be very helpful. I mentioned the use of them for acne. Antibiotics can also be used for infection, infected, say, boils and um, uh, other bacterial infections like impetigo. Um, the, um, the use of uh, uh, certain drugs that are called retinoids, which are derivatives of vitamin A, have been used for acne in the form of Accutane. They've also been used for psoriasis. And for that uh, one disease I showed you, the lichen planus, they can be used uh, for that as well. Uh, systemic steroids are used for some cases of skin problems. Uh, for example, the autoimmune diseases like lupus in the form of prednisone. And uh, so both topical steroids and uh, internal steroids can be uh, very useful. There are also many uh, less known drugs that are used in, uh, in, for treating skin diseases. For example, something called Plaquenil, which was actually, it, which is a, a, uh, a drug that's been used to treat malaria. And uh, Plaquenil is used for uh, some of the connective tissue diseases like uh, lupus. And uh, I have also used a drug called thalidomide, which um, many of our young viewers may not have heard of. Uh, however, you may remember back in the uh, in the uh, 60s, uh, patients being born without limbs, and this drug was initially used for morning sickness, and it was taken off the market. However, it has some really excellent uses for some of the more rare skin diseases that are chronic and uh, require a suppression of the inflammatory reaction in the skin. And it wouldn't have that effect if it was a person taking it that was not pregnant. That's before. right. It, you, of course, have to make sure you're not pregnant when you take that drug. Sure. The other uh, issue here is that you uh, elaborated upon uh, early in the program is that some of the skin disease we see are because of internal uh, illnesses. And so, and you've referred to that again here, but if that is the perpetrator of the problem, then you have to uh, treat that before the skin disease could get better. Then. That's true. And uh, although some internal diseases that are manifested on the skin, there is no cure for those diseases. And so we're reduced to still in order to help the patient with the skin portion of the disease uh, focus the treatment on the, the skin. However, for example, patients who have psoriasis and arthritis together can be helped by taking a, a small quantities of a chemotherapy drug called methotrexate, and that suppresses the overall disease process that's going on internally and does help the psoriasis. Uh, so that uh, you're right that um, in many cases it's, it would be important to find out what is going on internally and focus the treatment on that, and then the skin disease would clear. Sometimes it's multi-treatments, like you're saying, when you have more than one problem. Uh, something else that I want to make sure we get in on the program, and some individuals may not be aware that dermatologists are very involved in this too. In addition to the kinds of medication you've been describing, there's also surgical needs, obviously with cancer and, and so forth. And, we often think of surgeons not being dermatologists, so would you take us through mm -hmm. some of the kinds of uh, surgical uh, methods that you and other dermatologists would be involved in? Sure. Dermatologists receive at least three years of training and sometimes go on to a fellowship and uh, receive an additional two years of training for surgery for the skin. And uh, we uh, uh, perform both cosmetic and medically necessary type surgeries, for example, uh, excising skin cancers or uh, uh, removing lesions, uh, the nature of which has not been determined in the form of a biopsy. And, um, and also, uh, once, say, for example, someone has uh, it been determined by a biopsy that they do have a skin cancer, then removing that and repairing uh, the, the defect that's formed from the excision uh, to achieve a, a cosmetically acceptable result. Um, even simple things like removing moles are part of what dermatologists do. And we use plastic surgery type techniques to uh, optimize the cosmetic result because for 
many moles, the only reason for removing is just to uh, improve the appearance. And then there are other surgical techniques used by dermatologists. For example, laser surgery is used uh, sometimes for treating really badly sun-damaged skin where there are uh, lots of precancers, and also for helping people who want to improve uh, what time has, uh, has done in, in terms of their wrinkling, and they're looking for some improvement in, in the aging uh, appearance of the skin. And uh, also, um, chemical peels can help in that regard. So you do have different surgical techniques that, that you use in removing whatever it might be. That's true. Uh, do you ever, is most of that done within your office or clinical or, or sometimes hospitalization mm -hmm. involved? All, most of it is done in the office and uh, the minor surgeries performed under local anesthesia. Okay. For some of the more uh, um, involved surgery, occasionally uh, we will go to the uh, hospital uh, and work with, uh, work in the operating room. Um, now it's becoming so popular to do quite uh, involved surgeries as outpatients, and so some dermatologists have set up for um, a twilight-type anesthesia in the office, and they're prepared to, uh, to do larger surgeries that would require more support uh, that you would say if you were going to have uh, um, arthroscopic surgery as an outpatient or along those lines. It depends on uh, what the dermatologist likes to do. Sure. Janelle I would like to ask a series of small questions, and uh, they're ones that perhaps you can give us your reaction to. The first one is a lot of sun and the use of sunscreen mm -hmm. or some kind of sun product. I'm glad you asked that because it has been in the news lately uh, that uh, there may be an indication that sunscreen is uh, not that beneficial. Um, Briefly, the report that uh, generated that press release uh, was based on a, uh, a short time following of patients who had uh, been using sunscreen for about 10 years prior to the study, and uh, it looked as though they did not have a reduced amount of melanoma. However, uh, it seems that melanoma is, the risk of melanoma is really based on the amount of sun that one receives in childhood and teen years and so that it would be very interesting to have a, uh, a study that would involve uh, patients that have been followed for, say, maybe 30 and 40 years, particularly who had been protected in their childhood. Uh, I believe that sunscreen is very beneficial and that it should be used uh, uh, to try to block ultraviolet radiation, which is what causes skin cancer. And also to be careful about the amount of sun that you get. Yes, and to realize, however, that sunblock is not the entire answer, and that covering the skin with cloth protective clothing and wearing hats with a broad brim uh, is really much more desirable than using a sunblock, and that uh, just because you've got your SPF of 50 on doesn't mean you're being totally protected. What about shingles? Can mm -hmm. you explain to our viewing audience what are shingles mm -hmm. and what's the cause? Sure. Shingles is caused by a chickenpox virus. Uh, in fact, uh, pa patients who have shingles at one time in their life were exposed to the virus and may or may not have actually developed chickenpox. That virus, instead of being completely eliminated from the body, became dormant and rested in the nerves. And for a variety of reasons, at some point later on in life, the uh, virus came to life and made its way along a nerve and out onto the skin surface, producing chickenpox-like blisters. However, unfortunately, they're not just itchy when you get uh, shingles. You actually get a lot of pain because that nerve is irritated by the uh, reactivation of the virus. And uh, it can be quite painful. Uh, the important thing about shingles that uh, your viewers should know is that if you suspect you've got it, you need to get care immediately because there are now drugs on the market, antiviral drugs, that if taken within the first few hours of the beginning of shingles, that can make a tremendous difference on whether or not you have pain and, uh, and, and whether or not you have pain for sometimes years after the eruption. What about common allergies, people who have allergies and suddenly find themselves itching, scratching, mm -hmm. and um, perhaps it's to the sun or mm -hmm. to a particular kind of uh, washing powder or maybe a bush? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's almost a jungle out there in the world of of possible uh, substances that can cause allergies. There are irritation aller type uh, rashes and there are also true allergies, say from poison ivy, poison oak. 
uh, um, and some people are, are very sensitive to preservatives and lotions, for example. And, uh, and here they are itching, feeling dry, and they continue to put on lotion when it's a lotion they're allergic to. So um, you can pretty much uh, play it safe if you think you might be allergic to something and you'd like to use some kind of a moisture by using something like Vaseline petroleum jelly because petroleum jelly contains no additives or preservatives and it's extremely rare that anyone would be allergic to it. What about warts? Mm -hmm. Warts are caused by viruses and um, the virus uh, loves the skin and there's all different kinds of shapes and sizes and varieties of warts and they seem to, they can affect practically any location in the body and uh, there are many good treatments for them. Um, uh, I often uh, have parents who bring a child in who's got a single wart on the hand and I give them all their 12 different options for treating the warts and then I explain that when you've got 12 options for treating warts it's not a good sign because none of them uh, probably work very well or else we wouldn't have so many options. Um, and so, uh, and after we go through all of them, some of them being painful, others being maybe not too effective, uh, the, the mom or dad will say, well, what if we don't do anything? And I say, that'd be fine because for common warts on the hand, unless they're painful or bleeding or getting in the way of function, you don't actually have to treat them. Uh, and sometimes I'll just say, why don't you just put a piece of tape over them? Um, people laugh when I say try duct tape because it seems to be there's a thousand and one uses for duct tape. However, you, it is worth putting a piece of duct tape over a wart and leaving it there for a few days and changing it every so often uh, because it makes it, the environment moist and warm and hand warts don't like moist and warm. They like cool and dry. We're just about out of time. One more question on warts. I understand that they're mostly uh, on young people, as you get older, you tend to have some kind of immunity from them? That's correct. Uh, uh, as, as young folks, we are, we are subjected to a barrage of, uh, of viruses and bacteria, and including wart viruses. And so most uh, people acquire an immunity in their childhood years to viruses, and so that it's much more common to have lots of warts as a child than as an adult. On that note, we have to bring our permanent conclusion, Dr. Elizabeth Venice with uh, joined by Janelle Burke. Thank you for being with us today. You've been so informative. We'd love to have you back at some future time because there's much in your field we were not able to cover in this short time, but you were outstanding and uh, the information provided. And we thank you very much. My pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, I know you've found this program informative to you and we would like to invite you to be with us again next week when we're going to move to a different subject. Uh, we're very pleased each week to bring you uh, topics that are varying from time to time and I hope you will join us as we uh, talk about something else that could affect your life. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of instructional technology on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.